Now on Sky News Live, Peter Cradley. Good evening and welcome to the show. Well, very much the big news today was the sentencing of Cardinal George Pell for child sex crimes following his conviction last December. I will say something about this shortly and then that will be it. We will move on. I've got a special guest tonight and I'm keen to get into the impact of Labor's proposed wage policies on employment. Who might get an increase and who won't and if it'll all make jobs more vulnerable. Coming up on Credlin tonight. Opposition frontbencher Chris Bowen put some distance between Bill Shorten's Labor team and the ACTU as the unions push for a rise to the minimum wage. The British Prime Minister's Brexit deal, agreed only yesterday with the European Union, has been rejected by the Parliament in another comprehensive defeat for Theresa May. And Scott Morrison's Resources Minister Matt Canavan has backed Barnaby Joyce's call for a new coal-fired power station in Queensland. But first, at 10am today, Melbourne time, television and radio programming was interrupted to broadcast live the sentencing in Victoria's County Court of Cardinal George Pell for 20-year-old child sex crimes. Opinion is divided. I'll leave it to you to judge whether this live broadcast was warranted, whether it helped people to understand the sentence or if it was just another example of the demonisation of the guilty man. But whatever your view, today's events will not see an end to a legal case that's divided Australians. As it is for so many, likewise for me, this case is personal. I come at it as a Catholic, a lawyer, someone now in the media who as a child grew up in the Ballarat Diocese that was the epicentre of the abuse epidemic. On one side, there's revulsion at the monstrous crimes and breach of trust, anger, at a church that for too long covered up for predators in their midst and the implacable resentment for an institution that's so cold, so lacking in human emotion, so male and so out of touch. On the other side, there's frustration at the media that for two decades has made Pell personify the sins of the church. Dismay at our modern blindness to all the good work that the church and its clergy do every day, even today. And yes, some real doubt, doubt even after today's sentence, about how a jury could convict on the basis of uncorroborated testimony in unlikely circumstances. And in particular, I have grave concerns about the very establishment of the Victoria Police investigation in the first place. Catholic or not, who doesn't have a view on this case? I think we all do. And the very nature of the crime, child sexual abuse, makes it so much harder to discuss in a temperate way. If a crime had been something else, even, let's say, murder, debating the detail of the evidence and the conduct of the police investigation and trial would be a whole lot easier than this case, where so much guilt is presumed by so many on the basis of the sins of the past. I would not be who I am today without the education I received from Mercy nuns and from Jesuits at school and university. But I've also seen firsthand some of the worst of the church's dogma, its resistance to the realities of modern life and the damage it's done to so many good and sincere Catholics. I'm no apologist for the church or its hierarchy. I've seen people suffer the lifelong trauma of forced adoption practices of the past. I've been myself, on the receiving end of the moralising on IVF. Even as a schoolgirl, I argued against the likes of Cardinal Pell for the right of Catholic women to freely use contraception, so no one can accuse me of having a rose-coloured view here. And I've lived experience of the toll in long-term mental illness and early death visited upon innocent children that were preyed upon by the very priests and religious teachers that they should have been able to trust. As so many of you have also asked, how could decent men and women not have known what was happening and done more to stop it? 
Not just in the Catholic Church, of course, but in the Anglican Church and other faiths. State-run homes, the Salvation Army, sporting clubs, almost no organisation in this country was immune. Yet Pell, now a sentenced child sex abuser, after today, he was actually the first bishop to make it mandatory to report predator priests to the police and remove them from the church's ministry. Now, there's some doubt, of course. Some victims were never taken seriously. Many were not responded to sensitively and compensation wasn't always sufficient or timely. As well, Pell's orthodoxy and traditionalism upset some. His determination to speak out on issues where he disagreed with the zeitgeist, like climate change, angered the usual suspects and set him up as a figure of scorn in some quarters and outright hate in others. Yet George Powell remains the first major bishop in the country to lay down the hard and fast rule that a priest who couldn't be trusted couldn't stay a priest, and in this respect, Australian Catholics led the world. In my own lifetime, I've seen the shift from child sexual abuse being something no one ever discussed openly to something we've learned to talk about and something we have now at all levels of public life tackled head on. The victims of clerical abuse have been in an undeserved hell for decades. For them and their families, there will be no doubt some satisfaction at the fate of Australia's most prominent church leader today. To those who despise Christianity and scoff at faith, Pell's conviction must come as a triumphant vindication. But for those who still respect the church and have always admired Pell, well, for them, and there must be millions, this has been a very difficult time. For me, either way, this has been a dreadful challenge to my trust in two institutions that have done so much to shape my life, the Catholic Church and the law. As someone who respects both institutions, like so many of you, I've had to confront the reality that one or other of them has failed. Even today, after reading the sentencing judge's remarks very closely, the lawyer in me still has many concerns about the police investigation, conflicting evidence, the implausibility of the crime's time and place, and above all, the inconsistency of this crime with the man I have known on and off for over 30 years. Would the sentencing of a leading imam or rabbi or Salvation Army officer or even politician for similar crimes have been televised? I can't recall the media ever being so exercised as they have been in recent weeks. Now, that's not to say it's not of interest, just that when it comes to the Catholic Church, there's a very different standard applied, and it doesn't go unnoticed by an organisation that through its schools, hospitals and charities has done more good than harm here and overseas. The appeal will commence sometime around June, and when it's finalised, either a man who was respected and trusted will be found to deserve his fate, and an institution that millions look to for guidance and support will have failed in spectacular fashion. Or alternatively, the finding will be that a jury of his peers came to a decision based more on prejudice than fact, and that we, the media and others out today baying for blood, will have subjected an innocent man to a modern form of crucifixion, of reputational ruin after years of monstering. However it all plays out, I can't see many winners.